needs uh, to say something. And so, so if he's actually not there, I would suggest we swap, we start with the second talk. And then after that, we check whether Mohammed is there. Um, the second talk would be by Holly Little and uh, her team. And as I understand it, it, it has been recorded. And so it would just be played. Is that correct? Hi. Um, I'm Holly Little. I'm actually, my co-author will be presenting in a recording, but I wanted to say I'm here if you have questions um, or for the discussion later. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So someone has to press the button to play this. Um, I don't know who's going to do that. Are you going to screen share, Holly, or how, how does it work? Or Erica? We're pulling it up now. Okay. Hello, welcome. My name is Erica Grimmel, and I'm presenting this talk, Community Data, Mobilization, and Wikidata, a Paleontology Perspective, on behalf of my colleagues who you see on this slide. So the Paleo Data Working Group, which we are a part of, was launched in May of 2020 as a driving force for broader conversations about implementing data standards in paleontology collections. And it arose from a decade or so of increasing coordination between paleo professionals in the United States who were working on digitizing their collections. We have twice monthly happy hour meetings and our group has included representatives from around 50 institutions. We really see ourselves as a community of practice and our focus is on domain-based collaborative activities, including problem solving, mapping knowledge and identifying gaps, reusing assets, et cetera. Central to the community of practice concept is the idea that, quote, knowledge is a critical asset that needs to be managed strategically. And social structures provide more success than information systems alone in knowledge management. Any community relies primarily on individual people, and we recognized early on that the diversity of individuals in our working group was a strength. While many of our community members have long professional relationships, you know, just as many are newer to the group or are also early career professionals. And the institutions our members come from vary from independent museums to university collections to representatives from federal agencies. Okay, so during our regular working group meetings, we kept returning to an unmet need to have shared access to certain kinds of data in our collections, especially that related to people and to collecting sites. Typically, these data are digitized and managed individually by each collection or institution, or at best by a consortia of institutions using the same collections management system. Not only does this lead to redundant time spent, but it also results in isolated knowledge management. Wikidata has gained visibility in the biodiversity collections community over the past few years, and we thought it could be a platform to offer a shared knowledge management solution. Specifically, one benefit we expected from Wikidata is that it can allow us to improve knowledge completeness. For example, by working collaboratively to disambiguate collectors whose specimens are held across multiple institutions. One museum may only have the initials of a collector, another has additional biographical information for the same person. You can see how this might work on the screenshots on this slide, which illustrate how Wilmette Porter Cockerell, a 20th century American naturalist and collector, has been referred to in many different ways. Looking at these labels in isolation, we would have a difficult time piercing together who the collector was, or even knowing that these were all collected by the same person. The focus of much collections work um, deals on the what, the where, and the when of a specimen rather than on the collectors or other people involved. But knowing individuals can um, potentially fill in knowledge gaps for the specimens themselves. For instance, knowing the active collection dates for an individual at a particular museum, you know, that might help constrain the specimen collecting dates if they are not known. In addition, Wikidata can make our knowledge management efforts more visible 
and enable discovery for a broader audience. Wilmette Porter Cockrell contributed to our knowledge of biodiversity via her scientific collecting, but she was also an interesting person from a non-specialist perspective. Wilmette was an entomologist, Stanford graduate, and professor, and she frequently collected both fossils and extant specimens alongside her spouse, Theodore Cockrell, at a time when doing so was less common for women. Through Wikidata, we can contribute information about Wilmette's scientific collecting activities that complement her other known biographical information. Because it facilitates linked open data, Wikidata can furthermore make our data more accessible to both humans and machines. The screenshot on the right of this slide illustrates one tangible example of how important this benefit is. You can see that information about Wilmette comes up readily on a Google search, even if the only search term is WP Cockerel. The structured data displayed by Google is sourced from Wikidata. These linkages are made possible because each record on Wikidata is uniquely identifiable. We can connect our local databases into the linked open data ecosphere by storing Wikidata identifiers alongside our people records, as illustrated by the screenshot on the left of this slide. And finally, relinquishing total control over our specimen data or our collections data promotes inclusivity by recognizing that, you know, we may not be the ultimate authorities on every aspect of our data especially that related to people and to collecting sites, both of which are topics important to domains other than biodiversity collections. Even within the biodiversity collections community, sharing, for example, paleo data on, uh, or people data on Wikidata provides a way to show who is doing what work when and where, and to document the impact that they had on a particular collection or discipline. Many individuals involved with collections are not fully acknowledged for their work or have been misrepresented, especially those who are women, non-white, and or indigenous. So Wikidata offers the opportunity for their records to be augmented and or corrected. Okay, recognizing the benefits of a tool like Wikidata is one thing, uh, but figuring out how to operationalize our ideas has been and continues to be a process that just takes time. Over the past two years, we've gradually refined our concepts for what types of data would be helpful to put in a shared knowledge management platform, and we've taken steps towards mobilizing data through happy hour topics and hands-on workshops. Collecting sites were where we first recognized it would be useful to share data, primarily because doing so would reduce, we thought, the digitization burden for both transcription and uh, georeferencing. We were also inspired to focus on sharing data about people because of successful and engaging work being done elsewhere in the biodiversity collections community. For example, there was a 2020 workshop on mobilizing information about bat collectors to Wikidata and Bionomia. The first workshop we did in March of 2022 brought together 30 participants virtually for a hands-on introduction to finding, editing, and using data in Wikidata, focusing on people associated with paleontology collections like collectors, researchers, and collection staff as subjects. We used a shared Google sheet shown in the screenshot on this slide to have workshop participants list people associated with their collection that they believe were also associated with other collections. This list of people then served as a framework to organize our Wikidata editing sessions. Together, workshop participants created or enhanced Wikidata records for around 100 individuals, including a dozen female collectors previously known only by their husband's names like Mrs. Paul E. Drez, who we now know is Nancy Sue Drez. Through this hands-on work, we identified, discussed, and clarified how to deal with various situations, ranging from what the core Wikidata properties we wanted to capture for every person were, to how to back up statements with appropriate references, to what aspects of data privacy we needed to be aware of. A major result of this first workshop was the co-creation of a document, Guidelines for Using Wikidata to Mobilize Information About People and Collections, a Paleontology Perspective. These guidelines are designed to lay out conventions for creating and editing Wikidata items about people connected to biodiversity collections, as well as to serve as a step-by-step -step learning resource. While the examples used in this document all relate to people associated with paleontology, we wrote it to be general enough for the broader community to use, and we also published it in the public domain to encourage maximum uptake and reuse. 
Our second workshop, which occurred just a couple weeks ago, was on using Wikidata to capture uh, and share information about paleontological collecting sites. Data about paleo collecting sites is well suited for sharing because of the nature of fossil collecting, which relies uh, on relatively static sites, such as the Paleo Burn Green River site pictured here, which are then visited frequently and revisited by multiple collecting events over a long duration. Specimens collected during a single event are sometimes deposited in multiple collections. And many sites and collecting events in the paleo domain are assigned identifiers or codes that are unique enough to facilitate data sharing. Although without mobilizing a skeletal amount of data, it's difficult for collection A to know that collection B shares instances of the same collecting sites. This workshop built on experience gained by participants in the first workshop to explore the possibility of using Wikidata to curate this shared community knowledge about paleo collecting sites. 20 participants gathered virtually and began by defining the information needs and then assessing how well these needs might or might not fit into a Wikidata model. For reducing the burden on digitization, including georeferencing, we would ideally like to be able to share very specific information about the geography, geology, and potentially the collecting events of a site. And Wikidata isn't quite the right tool to share information at that level of specificity. Wikidata is, however, a great place to share information about paleontological collecting sites at a more general level so that it's more accessible to a broader audience. Although more notable sites are often represented on Wikipedia, Wikidata is a distinctly useful platform because it facilitates multilingual and machine access better than Wikipedia. Sharing general information about paleo collecting sites allows us to make connections between sites and institutions. One valuable area to focus on in Wikidata is documenting which institutions have specimens that were collected from a given site. Wikidata is also a good platform for sharing and using stratigraphic data. So chronostratigraphy from the International Commission on Stratigraphy already exists in Wikidata, and Wikidata can model connections between that and other chronostratigraphic scales, such as North American land mammal ages. Additionally, some lithostratigraphy already exists in Wikidata, and more could be imported in bulk from a source like Macrostrat. For stratigraphy, Wikidata provides an excellent way to record informal aliases for units where this is helpful. As for people, for stratigraphic data, Wikidata can serve as an information broker that can be referenced with a unique Wikidata Q number identifier. As much as we need Wikidata, it seems like Wikidata also needs us. Adequate properties don't exist for clearly relating lithostratigraphic information or for noting the repositories that hold specimens related to a site or expedition. So Wikidata enables data to be discovered from a non-specimen perspective, and thus is a really important complement to the mobilization we do via biodiversity data aggregators like GBIF. To this extent, we want to continue to add data about people related to our collections in Wikidata. In order to effectively share site data, we might need to spend more time refining guidelines the, for the Wikidata properties we want to use, um, and we may need to propose new properties. We'd also like to bulk import some stratigraphic data, like formations, into Wikidata from sources such as Macrostrat. And finally, although Wikidata itself isn't the right solution for managing uh, the more specific level of paleo collecting site detail we had originally pictured sharing, we are now thinking that maybe Wikibase could be an option. We'd like to close by highlighting how important these two workshops have been for driving our working group's progress towards this exploration of Wikidata. Each workshop provided us with the opportunity to expand the diversity of expertise and experience within our group by reaching out to colleagues who are primarily based in non-paleo domains, but who have intersecting interests in Wikidata. Blocking off time for each workshop gave our working group participants the space to tackle learning about something new and we were able to successfully use a combination of synchronous and asynchronous activities with tools like Zoom and Slack to encourage an active and collaborative learning atmosphere. 
these two workshops um, really created community investment within our working group. And so we're hoping that this initial um, significant investment sustains our ongoing activities related to Wikidata for the near term. So thanks so much for being here. Um, you can visit our working group website for more information about either of the workshops discussed during this talk, as well as a link to our guidelines document and information about our ongoing activities. This is an open working group and we welcome new faces at our biweekly happy hour meetings or in our Slack workspace. So we hope to see you somewhere else and thanks for being here. Thanks, Holly and Erica. Um, yeah, we are a bit behind time. So I would suggest that uh, questions go into the Slack channel and we will try to have some time at the end of the entire session for burning questions. Um, as far as I gather, uh, the team who was supposed to present first is now present. Uh, can they please um, just give us a sign? Um, otherwise, we will just continue with the uh, talks in the, uh, in the order. And uh, then in the end, we may have um, 15 additional minutes. So Benedict Mohammed, are you there? Can you talk? Can you present? That doesn't sound like a yes. Sorry, Mohammed is actually supposed to present, um, but he's finding it difficult to join the call. Um, so maybe if we can have like a five minutes grace. Yeah, well, then we will just move on with the next talk. And then after the next talk, uh, we can try again. And if okay. that doesn't work, okay. we will move you to the end of the session. Um, okay, awesome. So Thank you. Next talk is uh, Sabina von Mehring. Um, are you around? I think she's in the room, right? Yes, we're setting up. Okay, thanks. Okay, while uh, people are setting up, we can maybe spend some time on the Slack channel with uh, this, uh, questions. If you have questions to uh, the team that has just presented, put them in the Slack channel. If you have questions about any of the upcoming talks, you can put them in the Slack as well. Test, test. And uh, the our session does not have a dedicated discussion room, although everybody has in principle five minutes of discussion. Um, so we will have to end the session like on time. Uh, but the idea is that these talks stimulate discussion, further interaction. And uh, so we will use Slack for that initially. We tested earlier, then it was it worked fine. Full screen, yes. Fantastic. So um, my talk is, hello everybody. Um, my talk is titled Transforming Closed Silos into Shared Resources. And I will tell you about how we are opening up um, at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, um, our um, historic collection agents data um, of persons linked in some way to our museum. Well, people are obviously essential. Um, they are in, in many areas of our lives, but they are also central um, for linking information that is somehow present in our collections. Um, they are stable entities in the um, knowledge graph and also in the biodiversity knowledge graph. And um, some people are really well known. Um, you will probably recognize Alexander von Humboldt. Some will know Erwin Stresemann if they're somehow linked to ornith ornithology. Um, but others are, are less known and kind of invisible or um, their contribution to science has not been, been recognized um, properly. So this include women like uh, em Emilia Snedlage or Clara um, Ehrenberg, and there are many, many others. And, these underrepresented or marginalized groups, um, we, we would like to include them also further in, in um, connecting the information. So um, 
these two public, recent publications by um, a large um, international collaborative effort um, have been published. And um, this effort was led by um, Elspeth Heston and Quentin Groom. And this just a reminder that um, please don't, don't miss the talk on, on Friday um, at 3 p.m. when Quentin is talking about our last um, contribution. And um, also, I would like to draw your attention to our recent um, guest blog post on the Pensoft blog, which was just published in time for, for the, um, the conference. And it's, it's um, titled, Who is in your database and why does it matter? So please also have a look at, at this um, text. So um, at our museum, um, we have the so-called collectors or Sammlerwiki, and um, this is um, a resource that has been compiled over, over several years. It contains valuable information, uh, biographical information on, on collectors, but not only on, um, on yeah, just collectors, but also on suppliers of specimens, on other people involved in um, in the collections process, um, preparators, taxidermists, and other people involved. Um, so um, this wiki um, includes basic information, but also, for example, the, the GND identifier, which is from the German um, National Library, um, from the integrated authority file. It links to sub-collections in our museum if specimens are um, present in our collections. It also links, that's very crucial to archival material, um, correspondence or whole estates we have about certain people. And it also links to, to images um, that are in, in the, the archive. Um, in some cases, it's, it's also uh, linked obviously to references and to some publications. Um, so um, this, um, however, um, this, this information is just an, an internal wiki, so it's not available um, uh, to everybody um, externally, and, and this was basically the idea of to create a project, and we were able to um, secure some internal funding with the aim to transform, uh, transfer the information available in this wiki um, to Wikidata to make it, make it more accessible um, and, and um, yeah, to increase discoverability, transparency, um, and so on, as we've just nicely heard from, from Erica. Um, we are using an, an open participatory approach and um, are organizing editathons um, to work on, on the data and also to train people um, how to use Wikidata. Um, so in, in September, we've had our first editathon. Um, it was an internal one with about um, 20 participants from our museum from very different departments, and we've been training them on, um, yeah, teaching them the first steps of how to use Wikidata, um, explaining them about the possibilities, how to um, search, um, visualize, and, and use the data in there, and obviously also how to add um, to, to the in information available there. There will be a, a second external um, editathon, which will be um, uh, uh, online virtually. Uh, the first one was actually in person. It was quite, ni quite nice to have such a work workshop in person. And then the first, uh, on the second day, it was hybrid. So the second one will be um, for an external audience, um, people from other um, collections, museums, also including uh, the ethnographical or ethnology uh, community, because we will focus on collections in uh, colonial contexts. Um, so to, to support provenance research and um, increase transparency on, on what we have uh, in our museum, for example, and um, collectors or people linked to um, events in former German colonies, for example. So this will be um, in November. So from, from our wiki, um, we have a data set that's um, more than 600 records of um, historic collection agents, different people, suppliers, collectors, and so on. And about 80, for about 80% of, of those, um, they're already Wikidata items with a 
um, some basic information, sometimes quite um, uh, well, um, fully um, items with a lot of information. Um, about half of the people in, in the wiki were really former employees, and we also have information on their role and, and how long they worked at the museum. Um, and there, there's um, a number of items, it will be more than 30 at the end, that uh, needs new items, um, new Wikidata items we, we are creating now. Um, for part of the people in the, or the, the, the entries, the records in the wiki, it's currently not possible to, to create a Wikidata item because there's some information or there's just very little information. Maybe there's the link, a name, just sometimes only the family name and that the information that there's a letter in the archive. But from, from with this information, it's not possible to really uh, completely disambiguate the person. There's also some information on, on scientific expeditions, which is really interesting and should be worked on in the future. So what information are we, we adding or what are the, is the set of properties we are focusing on? And as I said, the basic biographical information is mostly already available, but we are cross-checking um, these. And, and what we are focusing on is um, then the, the occupation um, um, to, to really define um, that the person was not just a zoologist, but also to, to um, specify if the person was um, like um, working in an, um, herpetology or ichthyology or was a paleo, paleo person and so on. Then we will link um, to, to the museum um, if it was the employer or if maybe there was some other kind of affiliation with our museum. We will include the property for archives and uh, in many cases, the GND ID is already there. Other interesting properties include information about the academic network, uh, which I've listed here at the end. And then what is very important for us is also to connect between um, the person and the collections. And um, discussions in, in the community have shown that there's a high de big demand for, for such an, a property, but it wasn't um, possible to um, to state this in, in Wikidata um, yet. So we have proposed a new property property, and it's currently under discussion. So please have a look um, and um, yeah, put your questions, um, your information, um, and maybe your support uh, for this uh, property collection items at. Um, so this is one example where I show uh, how we are linking the information so the employer, Museum für Naturkunde, and the times and the roles the person had, first the research fellow curator and later um, as museum director, uh, in this example of Paul Macchi. Um, and this is how we're linking to the archive. We have created a separate item for the archive as part of our museum and are linking to the signatur or the, the inventory number from the archive and um, if possible, and that's what we're doing, especially for finding aids now, we are creating or assigning a DOI and adding it here as described at, at URL. And these are the next steps. So, so what are we trying to, to continue with? And we will continue with training and editing, um, add further collection persons, um, agents, including underrepresented groups, what is really crucial is to integrate the Wikidata identifiers to the collection management systems. And then obviously we want to link to the collections, but also, uh, for example, to the specimens using Bionomia. And another very important step is also to link uh, to the publications of the people and um, transform the author strings to, to the links to the uh, Wikidata items of the people. And then, as I, as I said, scientific expeditions can be really an interesting um, topic, um, linking specimens, places, people, and publications, um, which is yeah something we should um, work on in the future. And then maybe also expand to living people. So open up the information in your internal systems, make them available. We can assemble the pieces and get a, a better picture of, of what we are uh, what we have in our collections about the people. And then, as we've heard in the morning session uh, in Shakespeare, what, get the communities together, as we've heard from the paleo example, work together, share the data, and stronger we are together. 
And with that, I would like to thank my, my colleagues at the museum, um, the fantastic Tedwig people in um, Biodiversity Data Task Group, and also mobilize for um, the grant to come here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one short question. Uh, if there is anyone in the room or online who has a question directly to this talk, we can give that a try. I don't see anything. And then we can use uh, a Slack channel for follow-ups. Yes, um, I'm looking at the chat, Slack channel. Yeah, so um, I was informed that the team who was supposed to give the first talk is now uh, available, so we, we will give that another try. Um, Mohamed Benedict, can you say something? Can you share your screen or uh, otherwise um, give us a sign? Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, we are around and uh, I am really grateful for this opportunity having followed most of the um, presentations um it has really been very thought provoking and something we should all get on board to collaborate with today we'll be talking about um crowdsourcing biodiversity data um with your permission i would like to share my screen yes please okay all right so um we are going to be talking about the crowdsourcing biodiversity data in sub-Saharan Africa. And we are doing this under the umbrella of Wikimenta Africa. My name is Mohamed Kamal Jinfusini. I go by the username or the cyber name DN Shitobu. So online, uh, most people always find me as um, DN Shitobu. Now, what is Wikimenta Africa? Wikimenta Africa is um, a platform that is used in training um, inexperienced developers and programmers and technical writers in the African belt and in the African communities. Uh, we've come to realize that a uh, majority of the people who contribute on Wikipedia are just um, people who use the tools that are built by other people. Now, how do we then in turn train the African people to also be able to contribute to the technical knowledge or the technical tools that are built on Wikimedia or for Wikimedia projects. And that is Wikimedia Africa for you. So we have this biodiversity project that we are embarking on where we trying to get data on biodiversity data from the Sub-Saharan Africa. Because um, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the diagram you are seeing or the map you are seeing on my slide, or on your screen, you realize that we have um, a lot of knowledge gaps on the map. All these red dotted spots you are seeing are places where we have uh, biodiversity data on plants and animals. This is from the um, Global uh, Biodiversity Information Facility. They are in charge of putting biodiversity data on the internet. And if you look around Africa, um, you realize that uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and most of the African countries have very little information when it comes to biodiversity data. And what is even uh, making the gap more yearning is the fact that most of the plants and animals that we have are plants and animals that are usually not uh, easily identified. Perhaps they are varieties of other plants that are existing elsewhere. So how then do we get to leverage on free or outsourcing platforms to get to um, talk about some of these uh, plants and animal species that exist in, the, in Africa, especially the Sub-Saharan Africa. We have adapted the Wikipedia and Wikidata projects we of course we have wiki species and other related wiki projects but our focus is on um wikipedia and wikidata where wikipedia is um is an open source platform that is like an online cyclopedia we all know encyclopedia in our libraries so uh, wikipedia is more or less like an online encyclopedia that um that embodies the body of knowledge 
for the masses or, or for the people. And Wikidata is a structured form of this data. Wikidata allows you to link um, the data you have to other data sets or other uh, databases across the globe. Currently on Wikidata, um, we are fortunate to have over 3.5 million um, information on just taxa or on both flora and fauna. However, um, if you go back to Wikipedia, majority of these um, Wikidata items on taxa do not have articles, meaning people just get to see the structured information, but they don't get to read into details about some of these um, plants and animals. And uh, research has shown that Wikipedia is one of the five most visited sites across the globe. So if you, if you check the five most visited sites, Wikipedia is one of them. So if we have the taxa um, items or the, tax, the taxonomic information on Wikipedia, we are sure going to be explaining more of the biodiversity information that we have across the globe. So uh, what you are seeing here are just statistics of um, Wikipedia pages in various languages uh, on Wikipedia that have got articles on them. Um, we have the Swedish Wikipedia, the Wari Wikipedia, but our focus for this project is the Ghani Wikipedia. The Ghani is a language that is spoken in the northern part of Ghana. Also, um, another focus language is the, the Igbo Wikipedia. The Igbo Wikipedia is also a language that is spoken in Nigeria. And um, these two languages for now are the focus languages because uh, if you look at the Bani language, we only have 393 articles created for taxonomic uh, or for on biodiversity items. Now, how do you um, get to join us, observe these plants, or how do we get information on these things? We observe this information using um, an Android application called iNaturalist iNaturalist is, um, is an Android app that allows you to capture um, plants and animals information. So you can use the app to take a picture of a particular plant. Then this picture uh, geo information, that is the geographical coordinates of that particular picture you have taken is adapted. And uh, once this information is adapted um, on the map, as you seen earlier, the information is going to be projected for everyone to see. Then um, we use um, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility to help get the other related information of that particular plant. So there's, um, uh, how do we call it? There's an AI machine that helps you to identify a particular plant, just like, um, Google AI when you, or Google Lens, when you use it to take a picture or an item, it suggests to you a particular name. So the AI machine on the app, on the iNaturalist app, allows you to identify the plant you have captured. And once that is done, we import the image on Wikimedia Commons and then use the image to um, cross-check on Wikidata if that item or if that particular plant or animal species already have a wiki data item then we create uh, we update the picture if it doesn't have one we create a wiki data item for it hence we create a wikipedia article for it in other languages so as you can see uh, this is just a, a diagrammatic information of what i was just explaining so the man here is observing um, a biodiversity plant the lady too is observing that and once that is done it goes back to iNaturalist. We observe the global biodiversity information. Then we get to create, uh, we get to look at Wikidata, Wikimedia Commons, and Wikipedia for the information that is available. Then we can now go ahead to create. So again, once this um, uh, data is being uploaded, what is then uh, what we do next is um, adding the data box. Okay. What we do next is adding the data box templates to it, and in adding the data box template, 
Um, we use the, um, my slide is not moving. Okay, so, um, okay, good. So this is a, a data box template that we have here at, uh, that's the number two. The uh, iNaturalis platform allows us to use um, GitHub to uh, develop stack codes. And the stack code will automatically allow, allow us to add a title, a description, and an info box. And of course, um, a link to the Wikimedia Commons. So number two, as you can see from the diagram, is a data box. This data box is Wikidata powered. So um, when, once you use the data box template, it automatically pulls the data from Wikidata and is uh, ingrained upon the article. So this is another article in Dagbani um, that is linked to Wikidata. And what you see as number two is also the info box. So how do you get involved? You can get involved um, by also installing the iNaturalist app on your phone. And as you move around or as you interact with uh, the environment, you can get to add plants and animal species you can also join us on Wikimenta Africa. Um, I'll share the link after this. And um, you can also, if you're already on iNaturalist, you can help us with identification of the plants and animals that we observe in the Sub-Saharan Africa. So I want to say a very big thank you to the organizing team for this project. And um, more particularly, my team members, my mentor who is, um, Andra Wagmista and also Benedict Uda, who is the organizer for the Wikimenta Africa, and to all the Dabani Wikimedians team, the Igbo Wikimedian team, and the iNaturalist community. Thank you so much for the audience, and God bless you all. If you have any question, I am available um, to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have on the order of two minutes for questions and to prepare for the next talk. So if there are questions um, in the room or in the chat or on Slack, now is a good time to post them. People in the room are smiling. Uh, is someone from the room going to pose a question? It's hard for me to see. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. OK. Uh, then um, I would like to announce that I've just proposed in the Slack chat that if we want to have more time for discussion, I can offer to skip my talk. If you would like that, please comment on the Slack uh, message. I'll post the link here as well. Otherwise, we move on to the next uh, talk um, that was remotely presented by Camila. Is Camila around? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please go ahead. You have the video in the... I think at the beginning you tried it. Uh, we are setting it up. Ah, okay, thank you. Nope. There is four. Four there. There. Sort sort them by name. They are numbered uh, in the in the correct order. Yeah. Welcome to our talk. The topic what? of this talk is connecting index editors and Exicata IDs with Wikidata for disambiguation of people names and work in botanical and mycological collections. The main points of this talk will be definition and history of Exicata and Exicata-like series. Exicata series as published work. The web service index, this is the index of Exicata. Disambiguation of Exicata series. Disambiguation of person names. Linking index and Wikidata. And what would be the benefits of this project for the community? 
Exicata, plural exicatae, is a set of preserved specimens with printer labels, as you may see here in the image. The most important thing of the label is that they are uniform, numbered, and distributed. Uniform meaning that they all come from the same locality. Number, they usually has a, have a number. Usually it's a consecutive number, and this one is number 10, and you can see here in the, in the example, and they are distributed, meaning that they are published. Sometimes in the label, you're gonna see more information. In this example, you have that it has the title here, that it's Caracea Britannica Exicatae from Groves. You see, you have the species name, you have a little bit more information on the locality. You have the collection dates and you have the collectors. Sometimes the editors are not the same persons than the collectors. And in this case, they will also be written in the label. In 1906, the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants stated that the printed matter together with the Exicata or the Exicata-like series were considered a published uh, valid publication. Later on in 1953, it was stated that the printed matter had to be distributed independently for an effective publication, meaning that before 1953, the greatest number of Exicata and Exicata-like series were published. Exicata history starts in early 1700. At the beginning, they were published in book or in booklet forms, and the specimens were glued together with their labels. At the beginning, they were used especially in sales and on education, and later on, they were used in science and research, as they were consulted for taxonomic studies, especially because new species descriptions were sometimes included in the label. Today, more than 2,200 Exicata and Exicata-like series are known. These are about 10 million specimens in herbaria. It is important to mention what is an Exicata-like series. Exicata-like series are natural objects other than dried herbarium material. And it's important to mention that not all herbaria store their Exicata or Exicata-like series in the same way. Some herbaria store it in the main collection, while others store it in a separate room. Today, more than 70 series are running, and today more, one, more than 1,300 editors are known. Index, this is the index of Exicata, is an online database with bibliographic information on Exicata and Exicata-like series that started in 2001. Index gives you the editors, gives you the title of the Exicata or Exicata-like series, the abbreviation, of the title gives you the first and last issues. You have here the dates. It gives you like some extra information. It gives you the groups of organism and it gives you the Exicata ID. The Exicata ID is a stable and persistent Exicata identifier. If you would look in other portals for the same Exicata, you would find the same Exicata ID. The system Exicata is known from all organism groups with material, material in herbaria. Index in this of Exicata uses two components of the diversity workbench, uses diversity agents and diversity Exicatae. Diversity agents identifies the editor of the Exicata series, while diversity Exicata identifies the Exicata series. The web service allows the search for series or editors, organism groups, series titles, and other information, and it can be downloaded at CSV, XML, XLS, machine readable access. For the disambiguation of person's work, this is what we call Exicata ID. This was made through several comprehensive bibliographies and treatment of Exicata series. In the herbarium, you will find this kind of capsule, but thanks to index, you will find, uh, thanks to index, it's recognized that this capsule belongs to this Exicata series, Lichens Helvetici from Sherry LE. And in this example, you can also see that some Exicata can be superseded by different editors. For the disambiguation of person's names, this is what we call an index agent ID, a deep search in different portals was made. In this example, we have the editors Groves H and Groves J. So to really find out who these persons really are, we search in Bionomia, Harvard University, Smithsonian Libraries, IBNI, and other portals to really find out who these persons really are. In this case, we have that H. Groves is Henry Groves. And in here, in the Smithsonian Library, still too, in here it says that the Exicata was edited together with his brother, James Groves. It is important to mention that there is an NN relationship. 
that one editor can be the editor of one or more Exicata or Exicata like series. And the Exicata can have different editors. Now that we know who the persons really are, Wikidata is going to give us a Q identifier. And this Q identifier, we can link it to our agent ID through a URL as an external database ID. But the big question would be, how do we link his work? How do we link his Exicata ID to this person in Wikidata, keeping in mind this NN relationship? In this example, we have Ludwig Emanuel Scherer which Wikidata gives us this Q item, this persistent identifier. And then we can, even, we can link, as I mentioned before, this Q identifier with our index. And the big question would be, how do we link his work? Do we make a new property, a new Exicata work in Wikidata, a new property item? Do we link index Exicata ID with newly created Wikidata Exicata's ID, like new Q item for every Exicata or Exicata like series? Or do we link Wikidata person ID with Wikidata Exicata ID, keeping in mind this NN relationship? And how about the editors that are missing in Wikidata? Here we have an example, Sachito Inomoto, who is not in Wikidata. We have to keep in mind that all the editors that are indexed, they do fulfill the Wikidata criteria, criteria of notability by editing one or more Exicata work then we could add them as new Q items in Wikidata. How about the Exicata missing in Wikidata? Do they fulfill the Wikidata criteria of creative scientific work Exicata property item, a new property item? And then we could add them as Q items in Wikidata. And what would be the benefits for the community of this project? First, we will recognize the creative scientific work of editors of Exicata and attribute to their notability. Second, we will facilitate the disambiguation of Exicata works and improve the assignments of Exicata specimens to the disambiguated series. This is a special problem if the specimens are inserted in the general herbarium collections. And third, we would create synergies between institutional herbaria by recognizing duplicate sets of Exicata. And these more are questions for the audience. How would you, would you recommend that we link these editors, Exicata work, to their Wikidata? Do we make a new property? Do we make a new Wikidata Exicata Q item? Or do we link Wikidata person ID with Wikidata Exicata? And thank you all for joining my talk, and I'm open for questions. Okay, do we have questions? I don't see anyone uh, with a question here, but I have a comment. So there is a Wikibase instance called um, CACGRID that allows uh, fine-grained annotation of uh, documents. And I po posted a link in the Slack channel. Um, I think that is worth exploring as an option to host information about the individual oh, Exicata. Yes. And uh, then uh, once you have them there, you can link from to and from Wikidata, basically. OK, thank you. Any other comments, questions, uh, quest or suggestions on this? If not, uh then we can also um well we have like we're five minutes ahead of time now so uh we can maybe uh take some questions on the previous talks that we already heard if there are some questions still okay but okay well then maybe we can move on with the the next talk and then we oh, someone's running through the room is that for a question is that related someone wanting to <laughs> it's really hard for me to guess what happens in the room here it looks like there's a question okay good thanks Darren. <clears throat> actually i was just stretching but i do have a question uh in fact <laughs> so um 
one of, it's probably an open question actually to all the kind of Wikimedia um, contributors, which is that we have this sort of difficult relationship often within our institutions where we're so invested in trying to complete our silos, our collection management systems, and yet that's not really the place where we should we should be putting that data. So I'm really interested in how Wikimedia contributors are trying to bridge that gap between the content that we put into our collection management systems, how that collect connects up to the Wikimedia, and I mean that really broadly, so including Wikidata um, contributions, because that I think ultimately is our annotation bridge, but I've yet to see any sort of really convincing examples of how that gets all linked up. So I'm wondering if anyone from any of the previous speakers has got any thoughts on how we ma make that connection. Okay, you, you broke up for me at the last um, moment, but I think I understood the, the gist of what you wanted to say. And uh, I think the there are many answers to this. We certainly don't have time to discuss it in detail, but uh, some short answer would be that um, Wikibase is the software that allows the semantic uh, aspects of Wikidata, and you can run this on your own. You could run the, you could run, you could use it to run your document management system. Uh, or you could use it as a bridge between your system and Wikidata. And um, that is something that is currently being explored more and more. Uh, the example that I gave uh, in response to, to the talk we just heard, FactGrid is one of those examples. Um, it came out of a need to describe a certain set of documents um, from the Illuminati, basically. And uh, they had to annotate documents, they had to annotate people and relationships and events, interactions between them. And uh, that is um, using now essentially the same functionality, including the tools um, like quick statements that you can use to edit uh, Wikibase. And building an ecosystem of those extra databases that use essentially the same data structure as Wikidata, um, but are hosted differently, managed, curated differently, is uh, probably something that would help with this bridging that uh, you're talking about. But the details are complex and we actually need more uh, experiments in this space. It's just okay. one remark from Holly from the room. Yes, we still have time. Yes, please. Yeah, we have um, the short remarks, yes. Yeah, um, so this is something that we've talked a lot about and was one of the major differences between us trying to use Wikidata for people data versus sites. Um, so we actually do think that Wikidata is a really good solution for extending the information that we would have to manage about individuals um, since we share those across our collections and using the identifiers from Wikidata within our internal collections management systems can work kind of well. Although most collections management systems from our experience don't have a good place to put that identifier. So that's definitely one of the main areas of improvement we need to make this more extensible. Um, the sites are a little different because we're managing it at a much finer grain detail than you would ever put in Wikidata. So it doesn't help us in that sense. Um, I would just comment. I. I work in a library and a lot of the conversations we're having here about our collection management systems are very parallel to what librarians are talking about in their discovery layers of their cataloging systems. So I think there's an opportunity for a cross dialogue between those two communities because I think the problem, the, the information is different, but the problems are the same. Thanks, Steve. With that, I would suggest that we move on. So the next talk will be by Shweta Hedge, um, who will be talking about how to uh, get the information out of the IPCC and IPIPES reports. Shweta. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I'll get started and I think my screen should all be visible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we see it. Okay. Thank you. 
Greetings, everybody. Um, I'm Shweta. I am a final year undergrad from India. I study life sciences and education. I've also been a volunteer developer at hashtag semantic climate, where we develop tech and tools to liberate knowledge from scientific literature and also from reports like IPCC and IPBES. Um, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we are um, going about mining IPCC and IPPS uh, reports for, uh, for biodiversity related information. And I will also be talking about the roles that Wikidata plays, the information in Wikidata plays to mine and also semantify these reports. So let me track back a little bit to first talk about why we are interested in these reports. Well, these reports can save the planet only if we make the information in it available to everybody. But the information sadly is locked up in PDF reports, which are huge and is written in technical language. So it is quite impossible for any single person to actually read the information, read the reports and extract all the possible information in, that, in them. That's where um, machines come into picture, but we would we, we should be developing tools to you know first convert these uh, reports into something that is machine readable. And that's where hashtag semantic climate comes into picture. So let me now describe our tools and what we do. So what we do is we have tools to first convert PDF to um, something that is more machine and human readable, that is HTML. Um, and then once we have that HTML, we could be doing a lot of useful things. So uh, our tool doc analysis can pull out the textual information from these reports and then um, extract useful keywords, abbreviations, um, using state-of-the-art Python tools. And once we have these abbreviations and keywords and so on, we could be asking some basic questions like which are the terms that commonly occur in a chapter of IPCC report, right? Um, the next thing that we could be doing is, um, you know, do something more with these HTML that we've got. So what we do is we create what are called dictionaries, either from the keywords and abbreviations that we extracted previously, or um, you know, get these dictionaries from other resources. That it could be uh, Wikipedia, or it, we could we could also get it directly from Wikidata by writing up a Sparkle query. Let's say you want all um, the names of countries and so on. That could also be done. So these dictionaries are basically ontologies, and they contain information uh, about what the entry is, and most importantly, it also has a Wikidata ID associated with each of these entries. So I know I'm I'm pretty sure by this time you all know what Wikidata is and what a Q identifier is. So let's say you are interested in greenhouse gases. So our dictionary would contain the term greenhouse gases and it would also have the corresponding Wikidata ID. So this is how the Wikidata page would look like. It has a description about greenhouse gas and it's also got uh, other language equivalents uh, in the bottom. So we have this dictionary, then now what? Well, what we could do is then go back to our HTML and annotate the textual information. So you, you might be interested in annotating all the abbreviations or all the technical terms. So let's see, so what would then happen? What you would then have is a responsive HTML where you could just click on something and then that would take you back to uh, Wikidata. So, this is how a larger HTML document would look like. And this means that you can learn what these abbreviations and terms mean instantaneously while you're reading the report. Well, now, of course, we have a lot of pre-made dictionaries. Like I was saying, we have country, disease, drugs, so on. There are about more than 50 dictionaries. And typically, each of these dictionaries contain 1,000 terms or probably more unless it's a country dictionary, which has 190-ish terms. Um, okay, so the next question that you might ask is, can we do something more with these dictionaries? And the answer is yes. So what we can do is that we can um, ask interesting questions like, okay, what are all the common biodiversity related terms that are present in these um, dictionaries? Or you could create a dictionary with the terms that you are interested in and ask questions like, okay, in, in the terms that I am interested in, what are the, what are the terms that occur the most. 
and our tools can automatically do that. And this is a preliminary analysis that I did. Again, you've got the demo link here and I'll share the links to the slides also shortly. So you can play around with the Google Collab notebook that we've got. Um, so this, you know, the example that you're looking at, what cloud comes from an analyzing six, six chapters of IPCC reports. And I've, I started off with a biodiversity related dictionary. Okay, now that we've seen this, we could also, uh, you know, we've seen about frequencies just now. What we can also do is, let's say, you would want to pull out all the sentences or all the paragraphs. We could do it both sen in sentence level and also at paragraph level. Um, give me all the sentences which mention a country and a biodiversity related term. And if you ask that question, our tool can automatically get you all the sentences which mention a country and a biodiversity related term, like the example that I've shown you right now. So our tools can also help you know which sections of the, you know, of the report is relevant to you. And this sort of information could also be fed back to Wikidata so that in the next iteration, we would have more information to begin with. Um, so finally, um, at the end, we can, now that we've annotated the IPCC reports, we could also index them. Um, so let's say you want to know all the sentences which mention the term wetland, um, we can get you all the sentences um, related, uh, which mention wetland, right? And also point you to the part of the document which uh, from which the sentence comes from. So just, um, and also not just textual information, we can also pull out images and the textual information from those images because um, both the captions as well as um, the text in the images are also good places where uh, information lies. Um, so just to summarize, uh, our tools empower you as a reader um, to learn what these abbreviations and phrases mean instantaneously thanks to Wikidata. And our dictionaries can help you see the bigger picture um, and like what are all give you the frequencies, it can give you co-occurrences. And um, finally, like I was saying, it can also help you um, figure out which part of the document is the most relevant to you. And um, all the example that I've given you so far is from IPCC reports, but then we can easily extend this to IPBS reports. And here's a quick um, sort of example uh, and your help and views on this is also very much welcome. With that, I would like to end the presentation. Thank you so, so much. And thanks to Daniel, Peter, and the team for helping me set, you know, come up with this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Shweta. <clears throat> we have time for questions and comments. In particular, I would be interested in uh, opinions of those who have been producing such reports. Like, what can we do to like get the information out that went into them? And also, um, yeah, how how can we make those workflows so that next to decompose the hand hair into power again um, in more structured fashions, which is essentially what much of Tadwig is about, right? Uh, we have a question from Donuts. Okay, so the question is, that's Donut Agosti from Platzi. You do all these annotations, where do you store them? So you have these documents to make these annotations, but where is the, do you preserve them or where are they? Right. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I should have mentioned this, but all of what we do is up on GitHub and like as and when we do, we put them up. So we follow what's called open notebook philosophy. So at the end of the presentation, I've given all the GitHub links. So you can go to our semantic climate repository and there you would find all the annotated HTML versions of these IPCC reports. We've done it for a couple of chapters now and we hope to do it for all the rest of the chapters in the IPCC report. Okay, further questions or comments? 
Um, Donald again. So when you do these annotations, do you use any standards for the annotation, like WADM, or how do you do it? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Could you please repeat? Do you, when you when you make these annotations, do you use any mm -hmm. standards to make these annotations, or you just do them ad hoc? Mm. I'm Daniel, I think you should probably pick this question up. Yeah, uh, I think we, uh, we are using web annotation standards. Uh, Peter Murray Rust here. Yes, just to say we um, uh, closely follow the W3C annotation uh, standard. Oh, hi, Peter, by the way, I didn't realize you were here. Okay. Uh, we have a few more minutes for further discussion. I don't see what ha what's happening in the room. I don't uh, also don't see uh, any questions from uh, online. So no hands up at the moment. Okay. Well, then um, one option is we just move on. Uh, so I'm going to paste the link to my talk here. Thank you, Shweta. Um, and if we still have some time after my talk, then uh, yeah, uh, further questions and comments uh, would still be welcome. So I'm going to try to share my screen. I actually, um, yes, here is the share screen option. Um, here we go. I hope you can see that. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, so uh, in this talk, we're going to talk about um, how biodiversity related information can be visualized using Wikidata and Scolia. And uh, this is uh, work that, I've, that I'm doing together with my colleagues at the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Berlin. Um, the, I just posted a link to the slides and yeah, the abstract, you know where that is. Um, so structure of the talk, I will introduce Wikidata. I know there have been multiple introductions to Wikidata here already, but I will try it again. And I will also introduce Scolia, and then I will show some aspects of those visualizations and uh, discuss um, like potential next step. So <clears throat> Wikidata, um, yeah, as, uh, as it has been popping up here and there in, throughout the event, um, I thought I will just uh, collect some things that may not have been uh, presented in, in this concise fashion. So on the left-hand side, you have a summary of the data and words. So uh, it's kind of can be described as the edit button of the semantic web. On the right-hand side, you have a bunch of numbers. Um, so important to know it's, it has items and 100 million of them, including 3.6 million taxa. Um, it also has uh, properties that allow to link the items amongst themselves or to the outside world or to some concrete values. And uh, this link linking uh, occurs through triples. So there's 14 billion triples of the kind uh, that uh, is outlined here. So you have this one Q number and that a property that links the two to something. So in this case, it's a natural, iNaturalist taxon ID uh, 554, no, 54436. And if you click on that, you get to the um, iNaturalist entry of that particular taxon, which is Ubus Ideos, like the raspberry, or in Bulgarian, Malina, because Wikidata is also um, collecting lexemes, words and phrases in essentially all the languages uh, for which somebody contributes them. And in order to help with all of that, it also collects schemas about things. And uh, that could actually assist with some of the data modeling issues that were um, mentioned earlier. So if you try to model an excavation site or an exicata or anything like that, then uh, you can try to come up with a description of what should the properties be. And you can uh, bring that together in a schema. And there is a, an example here, a schema for a taxon treatment. Also important to know, in contrast to many other databases, uh, Wikidata has really lots of contributors. Um, 23,000 is, is normal. Of course, not all of that is biodiversity, but uh, a big chunk of it is. And most of those are humans. Uh, there are a few hundred bots. So far, no other species have been known to be involved. 
Um, and they do on the order of hundreds of edits per minute. And the, that entire set of uh, information is queried about hundreds of times per second. And um, yeah, all of that in hundreds of languages. And uh, Wikidata is now 10 years old, essentially, and 10th birthday is next week. Um, also important to mention it's open by default and it's fair like has been from the start even though fair wasn't the thing when wikidata was started um another perspective on this is here is just one template for wikidata properties that are somehow related to taxonomy and you don't need to read anything the main message here is it's big there are lots of different wikidata properties that relate to taxonomy and there are similar collections for other aspects of biodiversity so now an introduction to Scolia. Um, Scolia is one way to look into this giant um, graph of 14 billion triples. Um, and it does so by selecting certain pieces of information that you can combine in order to profile certain concepts. So uh, you can profile, for instance, people, you can profile institutions, journals, publishers, or topics, uh, as you see here. You can combine different entities of the same kind. So for instance, you can compare different institutions, different people, uh, or you can combine an institution and a topic uh, or an institution and a method uh, and, and so on. There are different uh, possibilities here. And we also uh, make use of external identifiers in various ways, including uh, to use them as a redirect. So if for some reason in your system, in your workflows, you don't know the Wikidata identifier for something, but you do know an, uh, some other identifier like the ORCID or a GitHub identifier or, or the DOI, uh, then you can use that instead and you will be uh, redirected to a co corresponding Scolia profile for that thing. Um, here is a bit of a typology of the uh, Scolia profiles. So uh, it does allow different kinds of profiles. Uh, so topic, uh, a taxon profile, uh, profiles for genes, pathways, journals, and many other things. Also software authors. And uh, the way these profiles are being built is we have a predefined Sparkle query that is missing one ingredient, and that is uh, the identifier of the thing to be profiled. But the, each of these Sparkle queries essentially already knows uh, which uh, kind of profile it is for. Um, and so basically, if you parameterize that Sparkle query with that identifier, then you get um, a particular panel and a set of panels uh, make up a profile of a certain type. I gave a, a number of examples here. So if you click on that, you get the topic profile for seed dispersal. If you click on this, you get the taxon profile for Phragmites australis. Um, and um, each of these profile types has multiple panels. Um, that, that then are um, assembled to uh, a page. So here, for instance, there's a panel that describes the co-use of certain resources. It's on the software profile. Um, and uh, also each of these uh, profile types has a, an associated curation page here marked in blue, uh, which is just added to the URL. And that kind of lists things that we already know are kind of missing on the profile itself. Uh, that might be uh, articles where the same author name appears as an author name and is, has not been disambiguated yet. It might be missing co-authors, missing topic tags, missing citations, missing publication dates, things like that. Okay, then uh, how can we visualize this kind of information? There are different types of visualizations that are being offered natively via the Wikidata Career Service. The tables, bar charts, scatter plots, graphs, timelines, maps, image grids, and so on. And um, we can also uh, visualize things, as I said, we can either uh, visualize one individual item or we can visualize combinations of items. Then the data sources for the visualizations that we use in Scolia are mostly uh, directly from the Wikidata Career Service. Um, we do some customization on that uh, using JavaScript, but by and large, it comes from the Career Service directly. But some of the panels actually use information from other sources, especially Wikipedia, Wikisource, or Wembedder, which does word embeddings. Then um, another aspect about the visualizations on Scolia is uh, you have um, some possibilities for interactive sorting and filtering. And then um, there are rich links between them. So you can hop from an author's profile where the topics are listed 
to uh, the topic profile of any of those topics and then from there to any of the journals or events or awards or uh, institutions associated with that two minutes um you can you someone said something which i didn't understand two minutes okay good yeah um and here on the right hand side we have a um table of contents example um that is for a topic profile uh here we have a number of those um profiles they don't yeah uh, resolution is not very high but it's all clickable you can um, make your way it should just show you that there are different types and they use different kinds of visualizations uh here i'm zooming in on one particular panel it's the panel on a work profile for that particular publication where we see which statements inside the wikidata knowledge graph are supported by that particular publication and yeah outlook is um, scolia can help explore wikidata can I help identify the highlights and the gaps in the knowledge graph it can also be extended to other graphs you can run it on your own wiki base and it can uh, be given additional profile types so if you want to for instance profile let's say type specimens or something like this we can think of ways of extending scolia such that this becomes possible there are challenges wikidata is incomplete it has lots of inconsistencies it's changing constantly, uh, and that includes the data model. And it's not always straightforward to navigate, but there are lots of opportunities, some of which we have heard about in this session. Uh, Wikidata provides a framework for scalable collaborative curation. I haven't heard the term citizen science in this context, but I would like to mention it. And I gave a talk about this just about a week ago. Um, it is increasingly integrated with open science and also open cultural heritage workflows. It is yeah, fair by default, it has an active community, and uh, if there is something wrong in Wikidata, it's uh, typically more easy to fix than if it is wrong in some external database. Um, and also, Wikidata can help highlight issues in other databases by uh, being integrated with uh, thousands of other databases. Inconsistencies between databases just become very apparent. And also, uh, it has a number of other potential uses, like, for instance, it can help make systematic reviews reproducible. With that, I would like uh, to thank my, uh, the organizers of, of the conference, the Wikimedia community, and biodiversity communities for like collaborating the way they do, the Scolia contributors, the funders of uh, the research projects uh, that help us um, put these data into Wikidata and visualize them. Yeah, and then I'm looking forward to some discussion. Thank you. Sorry. Are there any questions, discussions, remarks? Yes. Step. So I'd be curious, we can do this online and in the room, coming back to a very practical, how do we actually use this and, and to, if we are trying to do the work, so, um, from a collection management point of view, how many of you right now can your database both give and take? Can you reach out to Wikidata and look for information about, for example, a person in your in your database, see if it's there? Um, if you have information, is your database set up to push it back in the other direction and share with Wikidata? So the next group of people can find, for example, the aliases that you know about for a given individual. Does anybody in here have an example of their database that can do this. Can you push to Wikidata? Pull from Wikidata? Anybody? Holly? You want? Oh, good. Oh, Rakea. Uh, yeah, Rakea from uh, the University of Oslo, the Natural History Museum, Jeep of Norway. Um, so we store in our database uh, our collections management system. We store uh, Wikidata IDs for our collectors and also for the people who do identifications and stuff like that. And um, uh, when, for example, corrections are made uh, using Bionomia uh, for records, then we ingest it back in. Um, 
I don't know. Do you want like technical detail or? Yeah. Hi, I'm Nicole Carney from BHL Australia. Um, we use Wikidata to disambiguate the authors in BHL. Um, Rod Pages created a tool that allows us to pull uh, retrospectively assigned DOI data from Crossref and then swing back past BHL to pick up the BHL author IDs and then push those into Wikidata. Um, also, the mix and match tool that we use extensively to disambiguate authors uses those Wikidata IDs to allow us to disambiguate and push information to and from Wikidata. Um, hi, I'm Roger. Hi, I'm Wolfloor Online. Um, so we link to um, name authors. Uh, for plant names um, and uh, during the talk I just did a quick SQL query we've got 26,000 people so we link link to 26,000 people in Wikidata and I think that's uh, 1.37 million plant names connected to to Wikidata um, but I'll, I'll need to run that query again just to check but most most of them I think we've got links and I'll talk about it this afternoon so uh, this is Deb again. I'd like to add, like in our database, we're still working on this, but we indeed store multiple identifiers for a person. In fact, in our database, you're not a person unless you have one of those. Um, and we are looking at, uh, for those of you who don't know the tool OpenRefine, but has this nice little plug into Wikidata. So if you were to go in and do work in your spreadsheet that you put in uh, OpenRefine, about people, you can then use the plugin to push that data into Wikidata. But you can also put a list of people in your spreadsheet, run it into OpenRefine, query Wikidata, and find out that there's somebody there, then learn about them and their aliases, bring that back in. And then you can then link that in your own collection management system to then feed back that information into your CMS. Well, that, that was my question, wanting to know what the status is of us being able to sort of actively both give and take uh, this information. There's yeah. also one reply from Joan online. Um, the only example I've seen in New Zealand is Te Papa Collections online adding Wikidata items to their public people records. Te Papa people record IDs are added to Wikidata items. So I just, um, I'm Steve Baskoff, and um, we just mentioned, since we have a lot of Wikidata fans here, we, uh, uh, our university got um, a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation to produce like an intro, a multilingual intro to Wikidata, and I put the link in the chat. However, um, no one on our team was a native French speaker, and we got an outside person to do that, and Unfortunately, they didn't they didn't do the recording right to synchronize with our little puppet. So we have like the localized all the localized uh, examples, and we have a script and everything. And but <laughs> we got stuck at the very end. So if anybody's a native French speaking uh, Wikidata fan who'd like to help us get that across the finish line, I think the French community is like one of the largest communities in the Wikimedia. Uh, universe. So come and see me if you want to be a good Samaritan and help us get the French uh, part of it online. Okay, I have a comment on uh, Deb's uh, question. Basically, I would be very interested in uh, basically helping organize some sort of a workshop where we um, sit down together and try to work out for specific use cases, maybe one or maybe a set of use cases, uh, what the problems are and uh, what the potential solutions are. And uh, that could include, um, let's say, standard Wikidata, standard tools. It could include developing new uh, tools. It could include looking at additional Wikibase instances, either existing ones or setting up new ones. And it could probably also include writing plugins for the uh, data management systems that you have uh, different 
options basically looking at the entire pipeline and seeing what makes most sense and what is most reusable also um and for that it would also be important to know like for instance how many of you are using the same system to manage the data or at least uh, variants of the same system and uh, how many of those systems are open and and so on uh, all of these questions kind of affect the way you can integrate with Wikidata. Thanks, Daniel. And there were some head shaking yes in here to your ideas, both of like the plugins, the shared work, and, and the workshop idea. So thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah, so um, we, I think officially we have reached the time. Um, I'm actually very keen on uh, hearing more feedback, uh, more interactions between the Tedwick community and the Wikimedia community. Um, but yeah, there, there is a break for a reason. <laughs> and so I would say we stop here uh, with the official part and uh, I invite people to just uh, have further conversations about the topic and I will remain online here uh, for uh, a bit more to uh, see whether anyone wants to discuss any of those topics. I'm sorry I can't be there. Uh, that's just the way things are. And so with that, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to the session the speakers, the helpers. Just um, before people are leaving for the restaurant, small announcement. Remember that the restaurant of today is not the same as the other days. It's the Vienna restaurant on the same floor, but it's, I think, in, on the other side of uh, that uh, floor. Which floor? The third. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.